the Foundation for Media Alternatives, can you just tell me a little bit about how the organization is founded and what its mandate is? Oh yeah, okay. Uh, Foundation for Media Alternatives, or FMA, we call mm. it FMA, is basically established in 1986 after the martial law regime. Mm. So during those times, during the Marcos regime, there was a media crackdown. Yeah. So everything you said about the government should be pro. Everything is about good, nothing bad. Okay, so basically, FMA did a lot of things underground to be able to assert the communication rights. So during that time, a lot of people, specifically the human rights advocates, are not able to share their own views using the media. So FMA created a platform which is a TV program entitled Street Pulse. St uh, what? Street Pulse. Oh, yeah, Street Pulse. Okay. okay, so where everyone can share a public views and opinions using the TV program. So one of the hosts uh, was Risa Ondeveros. She is currently a senator, female senator, and one of the founder of that organization. So from... From there, we use the platform, which is the Information, Communication, and Technology, as a strategic platform or tools mm -hmm. to reclaim the democratic uh, space during that time. And then when the internet came in, in 1994 in the Philippines, we also looked into that, how we can maximize the internet to assert our communication rights, where we can share our views online. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, somehow, from then on, we had this kind of... There are three main programs right now. Mm -hmm. So we have Agenda and ICT. The other one is Privacy and Surveillance. And then the third one is the Internet Governance, which is the Internet Guides. And basically, all those things are being conducted a kind of research in various programs. So, yeah. Okay. That's how it works. You so you have a background in social work though. That, that yes, right? yes. So how did you end up doing the training for digital security? For the digital security, okay. So way back <clears throat> in, ten years ago, I was a social worker by profession. So yeah. I've been working with women, migrant workers, children and youth, and then coordinating with the government and other stakeholders. When I entered into FMA, I realized that. Uh, information communication technology is not just a separate thing, but a lot of women are now working using that platform and then the internet. And then I also see the trends that a lot of women are experiencing violence and abuse online. So I tried to understand how social work, in particular to women, the impact of technology to them. So. Basically, yes, I documented some cases of how women being abused online. So that's the starting point. And then later on, I tried to review some laws, particularly uh, women and how the ICT impacts. Because there are no particular law that protects women in the digital space. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's the good thing. And yeah. then, yeah. From then on, the digital security somehow, yeah, we've been receiving a lot of cases since I'm handling the program, the gender ICT program. Mm. So we receive a lot of cases asking for help, how to, uh, how to report if somebody stalk online or somebody harass online. So definitely, FMA is not a service provider. So there is no case management, but we do a several referrals to certain organization, for instance, to law enforcement mm -hmm. to address the cyber crime. Or maybe uh, somebody needs a counseling because there is no remedy on how to mitigate those things. Yeah. So, so we do a lot of referrals to a certain people or to certain organi organization to be able to address mm. that incident. Mm, it sounds like very, very important work. Yes. Yeah, and yeah. Also, we do the documentations because there are no documents. I mean, there are no living documents of how many women are being abused online. So mm. FMA is one 
uh, I mean, for the country, FMA is doing a case mapping of how many women and young girls are being harassed online. Mm. In particular, the online gender-based violence. So I was the, I am the one who is doing that, monitoring all those things mm-hmm. and using that reporting platform, Take Back the Tech, which was developed by the APC Association for Progressive Communication. They mm-hmm. created it globally, but there is a certain platform for the Philippines. Yeah, so we all all the reports is a, are already uploaded and use it as an evidence evidence base and we bring it up to the Senate for policy making, for drafting a statement, calling for action and so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. So those are the there's things. so much going on and so much to cover. It yes. seems like. So um, just to, I, I guess, focus in on um, the type of um, training that at least you've been doing uh, with us this week um, with groups working on very challenging human rights issues in the Philippines. Mm-hmm. But I know you've also done training outside the Philippines as well. But it, just in general, what are some of the biggest mistakes that human rights groups make in their digital security practice that you see um, on a regular basis? On a regular basis, I think... Since Philippines is one of the social media capital, no? for mm-hmm. the longest time, I mean, for the three consecutive years, FMA, uh, FMA, I mean, the Philippines was recognized as a social media users. Mm. There was already a study on that. And prior to that, uh, Philippines has been the text capital in the world. Mm. And then another one is we were also recognized as a selfie capital, not just only the text capital, yeah. no, but also the, the selfie and then later on, the social media use. So, I think being open, they were able to, I mean, not not just only the human rights defenders or as an activist, even the ordinary people, they don't value their privacy. Mm-hmm. When they posted it online, they don't care if anyone can see it or not. So, they just posted it, posted it as the way it is. They don't care. They want to share a lot of stories happening around. So I think that's one one of the did I call this one? One of the bad practices. And second, they also try to document everything and then put it online. Hmm. And then also they use and most of the instances there are several uh human rights group or individuals where some of their accounts were hacked and compromised because they use one password in all accounts. I think that's the bad thing. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. I think that's that's the common mm-hmm, mm-hmm. digital issues that they encounter yeah. day to day. Could you, do you have a, a sort of a specific example of a situation where, um, you know, a security vulnerability was exploited by someone from the outside to to the detriment or that that caused harm to a human rights organization that was quite significant yeah i mean for instance in my own experience since i am very vocal in this current administration Mm -hmm. during the election campaign up to this present when i shared a lot of things about my sentiments and this human rights violation and uh, i mean a kind of remarks coming from the President Duterte during that election election campaign, mm. uh, I was attacked by someone. I don't know who's this person, but this guy. I know he is a guy. He cre- he created a specific account using my photo and other personal information, like the school that I've attended, the the place where I live. So was this on Facebook or something? Or yes, what? it's a Facebook. Mm. And then he screenshot my photo on my Facebook account and then he created a new one. Mm-hmm. But he he never used my real name, only the photo and the locations that I've been studying. I mean the school that I've attended and then the place where I live. And then later on he used another I mean he used a screen name which is uh, I don't know who it's Marian Darna. Darna is an iconic female iconic hero in the mm-hmm. Philippines. So he used that name, and then tagging me that um, I. He's tagging me that I am harassing other people oh, online. Uh, okay. So 
The second thing, after that, I also received a threat. Well, basically, my understanding was this guy was just reporting an incident that someone is harassing him. Mm. But later on, when I trying to dig down the the information, this is unusual because that was the first time that I received. And directly to my personal account, not on our platform. I considered it already as a threat. But that this guy is already threatening me. Mm-hmm. And he wanted me to stop talking about the administration. The third incident was this guy emailed our company telling that they already reported me at the law enforcement and being monitored. So those three things was really creepy. And mm-hmm. then I think that's those I think that's the basic uh, experience that I've encountered. I already received an identity theft and mm-hmm. a kind of harassment and then of course the impact on my day-to-day activities was really uh, difficult for me to go out outside because from the time I go home to my office or to my school I don't know if someone is trying to stalk me or someone is following me, following me so I have to spend a lot of money just to change my daily route right. and then have to ask somebody to accompany me wherever I go and I cannot I cannot go out my house without informing other people. If somebody's trying to pass by, I always lock the door and you know and the window. Mm-hmm. Something like that. Those are those are the things that happened to me last year. Actually it was happened last year right. in August. So since then uh I have to do something you know, for my own security. So I have to go to I went to the law enforcement and reported all those incidents. Luckily, there were all those allegations was not true. I have no records, any records from the law enforcement, both in NBI and PNP. So, so when I tried to to do a digital security things to identify this guy, I found out that it was my childhood friend. Uh-huh, yeah. Okay. He is my classmate since kinder, and we grew up together. And then I found out that he is a prominent supporter of this current administration, particularly the Duterte, uh, the President Duterte. So I tried to contact him, but he declined and uh, reject all the kind of allegations that I found. So yeah, I threatened him personally and told him that if you don't stop doing these things to me, I can charge, uh, I can file any charges from you from administrative to civil case. And then he stopped afterwards. Yeah, th- mm-hmm. those, I think those are the things. And some of the human rights defenders are now being targeted by the law enforcement by snooping their Facebook account. Mm-hmm. So those, I already, I think, rules. I think five of them are being surveilled mm-hmm. by the law enforcement. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So now's the time to really work on securing all of their yes. online presence. It's not something you've taken for granted. Yeah, and I think I think one of the bad practices also uh, they use a lot of time using Facebook to organize right the social action. I mean the mobilization yeah. action. Mm-hmm. And then whenever I call their attention, oh, do not use Facebook as your platform to organize people. But for the for convenience mm-hmm. wise, this is the only way to reach people using Facebook Messenger. Mm. So I think since you are being targeted by the law enforcement or other predators, it's easy for them to track the movement, the plans or the strategies that you wanted to do. So yeah, it's really hard for them to convince to use the security. Uh, I mean, the secure online communication like Signal yeah. or encrypted email. Yeah. yeah. It's because it's not the way they use it before. So, yeah, it takes a lot of time, actually. Yeah. So, convenience is the enemy of good digital yeah. security, security hygiene, I guess. So, on that note, I mean, what would be your sort of top three things that a human rights defender should be doing today to improve their... Digital. digital security hygiene. I mean, if you meet someone who really isn't taking care of things as they should be, what would be the first three things you would tell I think, them to do? I think the first thing uh, that 
they should do is first, they have to conduct a digital audit. All kind of accounts that are associated to their personal and organizational, they have to identify which account is more secure or safe. And then second, try to create a separate account for your personal matters to your organizational or maybe they can create another persona which is not affiliated to their own personality or to their own organization. That's the thing. And then third, uh, do not use password over time. Okay, so there are a lot of, I mean, I know a lot of people who are using one password in all accounts. Surprisingly common, I think. Isn't yeah, it? it's a common thing. And then another one, they all they also associate it with their own personalities. Like for instance, the anniversary of their parents, mm. or I mean, the special events, you know. And then yeah, I think it's, having a strong password is always your first line defense. Yeah. For online safety, mm-hmm. those are the three things. Mm-hmm. And then the rest are will follow. Yeah. So one of the things that people often say when they are told, oh, you need better passwords, you need different passwords for different accounts, you know, the first response is, well, how do I remember them all? And, you know, we don't want to be writing them down, leaving yeah. them on paper. What is the best solution for storing and keeping track of multiple passwords? Yeah, uh, yeah. like earlier, you know, I discussed about uh, there is a software tool where you can use, where you can store all your different passwords or email accounts and put it in one platform. So we used a password manager. So where you have to remember at least one master key password and then you put all together all your accounts there. So once you created that account, all you have to do is to remember the one master key. And then the rest you can also you can also you can put everything there and then copy and paste it to your specific account. Yeah, so yeah. Using password manager somehow is really useful. And then the other one, of course, if you're not really, I mean, if you're not really familiar with that, I think you have to enable your multi-factor authentication. There are several ways to activate it using your mobile phone, your email addresses, your one-time password, just to get all those things before you will get access to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think those are the two things that maybe somehow yeah. you can use it. It 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 gets you much further along the road to being secure, doesn't it? Yeah, I, I think added layer of security is more important than nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. So, um, if someone is, if it, if it, if an individual or an organization is learning more about improving their digital security, whether that be here, the Philippines, or in different countries, mm-hmm. wherever they are. What what are some of the steps they can take? Where can they go for advice and support? What would you recommend for people who want to learn more? Okay, there are several platforms where they can uh, look into informa- for that information. Like for instance, Tactical Tech. It is a large group based in Germany. And it is a collective group actually uh, organized by civil society and human rights defenders. There are a group of female, LGBT, uh, techie people who can assist you for that. So they already co- came up with a digital security module where they can apply it. And then, for instance, if, I, if I'm not available, other people can do a digital security using that platform. Uh, there's another group, which is Access Now. It is. They have a helpline hotline, mm-hmm. so they are twenty four seven, and and it's regional base. So if you're based in the Philippines and you want, you need a twenty four seven hotline, you can get in touch with them, and somebody from the Philippines can look into that. But if you're based in Cambodia, they will find a Cambodian people to assist you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I had an experience earlier this year of receiving a spear phishing email. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, what are some of the things that, um, you know, if you receive an email, you, you don't know who it's from, uh, and uh, the content seems a little suspicious to you, mm-hmm. what should you do? Well, at the beginning, you already recognize that the email address is not really familiar first. And then second, you have to look into the subject title 
If it's not related to your work or to anything about you, don't open it. If you accidentally open it, it's okay to read. But if there's a link portion, never click it. <laughs> so those are the things that you may consider. If the, if the content is quite malicious and there's a link to, con to direct to another platform, never click it because they might steal some information from your account. Yeah, yeah. So better not to read it from the beginning. Maybe you can delete it or just block it. Yeah. Or report it as a spam message. Yeah. yeah, those are the things that you may consider. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, that's all the questions I have for you today. Thank you so much for sitting sure? down and having a chat. <laughs> <laughs> we really appreciate yeah. bringing, you, bringing your expertise and insight. Yeah. So thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you.